Uh, it's our pleasure to have you join us today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Luke. I am the Senior Director of Sport Integrity at the CCS, and this is an issue that falls within my portfolio. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by David Leck, our General Counsel, as well as two other staff from the CCS, Elizabeth and Amanda, who have helped put together today's webinar. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Lizanne Murphy at the COC for some introductory remarks. Go ahead, Lizanne. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here today. We're really excited to have you here and thank you to all for your commitment just to helping advance sport that's run with integrity and safely and ethically in our country. So I'm Lizanne Murphy. I'm the manager of National Sport Organization Services at the COC and I work very closely with Mark McGregor and this is one of the files in our portfolio and I'm the single point of contact as it relates to the IOC and their involvement in this file and so we want to help we want to help you folks advance this work in your NSO. So we will be here to support both alongside with the, C the CCES and then because this will be a file that's going to take on greater importance, especially with recent announcements on sport betting in Canada. And so just to let you know that we're glad to have you here and we're really excited to support you in this work because we know this is one additional file on many that are already on your plates. So thanks so much for being here. And it will be recorded. And for those, for your colleagues who aren't here today, it'll both be available on CCS's website and at the NSO Sharing Center. And so we'll drop the link in the chat for you all to be able to find that. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Elisanne. And um, welcome to Marg as well, who's uh, on the, the call from the COC. Um, so we will stick to an hour. Hopefully we'll be even a little less than an hour. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat function um, as uh, throughout the presentation, and then we can uh, try our best to address any of your questions at the end of the session. Um, Lizanne has placed in the chat function uh, access to the slide deck uh, in French, if you would like to follow along in French. And while most of today's session will be delivered uh, in English, if you have any questions or interventions you'd like to make in French, you certainly feel free to do so and we will respond um, accordingly. So we'd like to start um, by acknowledging the Indigenous people and the... My, sorry, I'm having computer issues here. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. So we'll move along to the next slide. And today we have five objectives that we'd like to try and address. The first is to update you on efforts that we've undertaken in Canada to address the issue of match manipulation. We'll remind you of the issue itself and some statistics around gambling and sport. Lizanne will bring you up to speed on developments from the International Olympic Committee and a code that has been developed on the prevention of competition manipulation and how that may apply to your sport organization. We will then share with you some resources that we have developed, the COC, the CCES, and a small working group of national sport organizations, uh, resources that we hope will be really helpful. So as Lizanne mentioned, we, we wanna try and be as helpful as we can as you look to try and address this issue by providing effective and concrete resources for your use. Um, during this part of today's webinar, you'll also hear from two leaders in the sport community who will share with you their perspective on the issue and what their sport is doing to address it. We'll finally, we'll end with um, an outline of some assistance that we think we can offer um, and share with you and uh, provide you with contact details for how you go about accessing that assistance. So that's our objective for today. We'll move along. And to start with, on our first objective, updating you on Canadian efforts, really there's two um, tracks, I would say, two parallel tracks that we can update you on, on developments around match manipulation in Canadian sport. There's what I would refer to as a policy track, 
And then the other I would refer to as the legal track. And really the policy track is work that in the sport community we've been doing to try and increase awareness of match manipulation. And that started in 2019 with an international symposium that we, we hosted in Toronto, bringing together experts from around the world to share their approaches to dealing with this issue. Um, that led to the development of a white paper, which still exists on our website today that outlines a series of recommendations for the sport community for how we can go about dealing with this issue, education materials, policy approaches, those types of things. That then led to the decision by the CCES and the COC to put together an exploratory working group with a number of NSOs to think about what type of resources we could develop to help sports move this forward, which has led to the development of a template policy, which we shared with the sport community in the summer through an advisory note, um, but will also be the focus of today's webinar. So that's kind of the first approach or the first track that I was referencing around um, policy. The second track says legal track, which is the legalization of single event sports betting in Canada, which took place over the course of the summer. So prior to Bill C-218, the criminal code prohibited betting on single event sports. What it did allow for was betting in a parlay fashion on multiple sports at the same time. But it, the prohibition was removed through the passing of Bill C-218. The idea being that that type of betting was already occurring and it was being driven underground in an unregulated market and it was causing issues. So the government um, chose to move forward in legalizing single event sports betting. But what's likely to happen as a result of that is an increase in gambling on sporting events, events that you could be running or organizing or operating or that your athletes are participating in. And with increased betting uh, comes an increased risk of sport. Uh, manipulation. So we wanted to bring you up to speed on the fact that that legislation has since passed. Both the CCES and the COC were involved in uh, committee meetings with the House of Commons and then with the Senate uh, advocating for the passing of the legislation, but also advocating for measures to be taken to ensure that Canadian athletes are protected from the risk of match manipulation. So I wanted to highlight those two things that have kind of been moving in parallel, the work of the sport community around policy initiatives to deal with match manipulation, and then the legal aspect that's been happening at the same time around the passing of Bill C-218 and the legalization of single event sports betting. So that's the first objective, running to bring you up to speed on those two developments. We can now move to the second objective. And just as a quick reminder, what is this issue? We developed an uh, infographic, which is available on our website. Um, and it's on the right side of this slide, which just shares with you some key details around this particular issue and its relevance. So, so what is the issue? As you all know, uh, match manipulation is a deliberate effort to manipulate and influence elements of a sporting contest or its outcome. So essentially, it's an athlete or a coach or a support person or, or an official trying to intentionally manipulate certain elements, such as whether or not a player was offside in soccer, or whether or not a double fault occurred in tennis, or the outcome. And it's often tied to gambling, because at the same time, someone is wagering money on that particular element of the contest or its outcome and stands to gain financially um, in, in some cases quite significantly. That's the issue. Um, it happens uh, a lot in certain sports and in international sports um, who have also put in place efforts to try and address this particular issue. Some stats on the right side of this infographic that we produced to share the volume of gambling that occurs on Canadian sport. Um, the, the 20 billion figure is one that uh, it certainly demonstrates the volume of gambling that occurs on Canadian sport. That's $20 billion on an annual basis. And that statistic comes before the government of Canada's decision to legalize single event sport betting, which we predict will result in an increase in volume of gambling. So who's at most risk from this issue? As I mentioned, it's athletes, it's coaches, it's officials, 
um, it's athlete support personnel. And what's at risk? When we think of match manipulation, we see it as a safety issue first and foremost. Um, often it's tied to organized crime and it presents serious, serious risks for our athletes. And we wanna make sure that we can educate them about the risk and provide them with resources and places to go if they ever find themselves in that situation. So that's a quick reminder on the issue we're addressing today and also just sharing with you an infographic that's been produced, which you certainly can use if you find it helpful. So we can now move on to the third objective of today's webinar. And for this, I will turn it over to Lizanne from the COC to speak about the IOC code on the prevention of the manipulation of competitions. Lizanne? Sure, thanks Jeremy and hi to everybody. So this is one of the files that the IOC is, has identified as a top threat to the integrity of sport. And so with this, Canada, as the Canadian Olympic Committee as the National Olympic Committee, here we have a, re a requirement as an IOC member to advance this file and this work in Canada. And so that's our objective in collaborating with the CCS to support all the national sport organizations here to advance this work. And with this, it's really looked at seen through the lens of athlete partic uh, as, um, participant safety. So just building on what Jeremy had touched on in the previous slide, there is a code that exists in this space from the IOC and many of all participants in games, whether it be the Olympics, the Youth Olympics or the Pan American Games, they have signed off on it. But this work and the work domestically is becoming more and more important to not just sign off in a games participation, but rather to be involved you know, every day in, in the daily training environment and NSO environment. And so this work and the way the IOC has framed it is really around the three pillars that are mentioned on the screen here. One being in regulation and legislation, which is where we're hoping the policy will kind of cover that base and help support. The awareness raising and capacity building. So that's again, in our collaboration with CCS and some of the education materials that CCS will be providing to capture that. I will be sharing after this a link that has some of the resources that the IOC has already produced. They have a series of webinars and a series of education modules that are available to all participants. So I'll drop the link in the chat shortly after this. And then the third part, which is still to be defined and will be kind of at the responsibility of each of the organizations, although the IOC does have um, an investigation unit that as it relates to the games participation, but that's the third pillar. And so, Amanda, if you can jump over to the next slide. So, so with this, everybody, all of these organizations, if you have sent athletes or coaches or any team members to participate in an Olympics, a YOG, or a Pan Am Games, this would be part of the participant um, agreement that is signed. So just, just so you know that that does exist, and it's part of that long agreement and this couple-page document that's there, but there is quite a bit more behind it. And where the regulation at games participation exists, it would be things like purposely underperforming to control a result, betting on your own sports during the games or betting on any Olympic or Pan American results. It would also include the sharing of information that could lead to any of the three uh, pillars mentioned there. And then also a failure to report if there is a knowledge of the, the manipulation of competitions or failure to cooperate with an investigation. And so those are some of the things that exist now. And then again, I'll drop the link in the chat just so that you can have more of that context. And right now there are resources through Athlete 365 and the IOC that we will be sharing within our sport networks. CCS will be producing more. And then as more things become available, we will make sure to share them uh, with our members. And with that, there's also a new campaign and perhaps opportunity, if this is something that your organization feels strongly about, the IOC is engaging athlete mentors in this space. And so if you have athletes or in your organization you feel very strongly and you'd like to have more visibility on the international stage, there is an opportunity to have athlete mentors and athlete ambassadors in this space. So if, if that is of interest for you, I'll drop my email in the chat as well, because we can reach out and have, I can give you more information and we can kind of have that discussion. So with that, I'll hand it over, but Marg and I are available for any questions that you have as it relates to on the international scene or any way that we can support here. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lizanne. 
That's great. And um, it certainly seems like from the IOC's perspective that they're placing a really high priority on this issue um, based on the, the number of meetings that they've had and the resources that they've developed, which I think is great. Um, so we'll move on to the fourth objective of today's webinar, which is to introduce you to some resources that we developed through a working group that was put together. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, and the, the thinking behind this working group really was following uh, the symposium that was held and some other meetings um, around our exploration of this issue. Some sport organizations reached out to say, we feel really ill-equipped to be able to deal with this issue. We don't know a lot about it. We don't have resources um, to respond to it. And they wanted to be able to seek some assistance so that they could be prepared um, to deal with any requirements that might flow from the International Olympic Committee, to deal with any requirements that might flow from the government of Canada through its legalization of single event sport betting, and through any requirements that might come just from your own international sport federation that's looking at this issue. So they reached out to say, we need some help. And in some cases, um, the point was made that we don't have a policy that deals with this directly. Um, we may have a number of policies that kind of pick up on the issue here and there, but there's nothing consolidated. So we struck this working group that the sport organizations that were a part of it are listed along the bottom, along with the CCS and the COC. And the first goal of the working group was to say, how do we develop a policy, that a template policy that would meet all of the requirements of the IOC um, that would help a sport organization take it and be able to implement it and feel confident that they put in place uh, an effective approach to try and mitigate the risk. So that was that was the goal of the working group, and that's the the um, outcome that we're able to share with you today. But before I jump into sharing the elements of the policy, um, there are two people that have agreed to to share their own perspectives from the working group. So if we move to the next slide. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to first call on Dan Wolfenden, Executive Director of Squash Canada, who's offered just to share his perspective um, from an NSO on this particular issue and the benefits of the resources that have been developed through the working group. So if Dan's available and able to unmute himself, I will turn the floor to you, Dan. I don't actually see Dan in our participant list unless he has another name up there. So he must have gotten caught up somewhere. Okay, well, we'll see if we can figure out Dan's um, availability to <laughs> confirm he would be able to, to speak today. But while we do that, let's, uh, I see Earl on the screen, so I know he's with us. Um, Earl Cochran is the Deputy General Secretary, of Canada Soccer. Uh, tremendous amount of experience with this issue and has been really helpful uh, to the working group and to the CCS as we've tried to understand the issue in some ways to be able to try and to deal with it in the Canadian sport community. So I'll turn it over to you, Earl. Thanks, Jeremy. And I think I sent a note to Dan yesterday, you know, saying it was going to be difficult to follow in his footsteps. So I think he's sandbagging me here. Um, I'll have a word with him after. Look, you're not, I appreciate it. Um, you're not going to find probably someone happier um, that we're that we're doing what we what we've been doing over the last kind of couple of years, um, speaking on behalf of the sport that's probably gambled on the most globally. Well, not probably, it is gambled on the most globally. Um, before I kind of dive into into what we've been doing uh, here domestically and internationally with with our with our international body FIFA. Um, I, I want to thank the COC and, and the CCES um, and the entire group, the, the working group that had put in some, some heavy lifting uh, over the last kind of several months. Because um, this policy or the development of the sort of regulatory pieces to protect our sport um, are vital, right? Um, not just for the integrity of, of our sports and, and the athletes and the participants, but, but of our competitions at the same time. Um, it's also a significant step in some risk mitigation, to be honest. Um, 
you know, this has been an issue for us um, since the 80s um, and, and more recently um, in the early kind of 2000s. Uh, and so FIFA have taken this um, very seriously for a long, long time. And I think, I think, uh, Lazan, I think you had mentioned it earlier on. Um, you know, the, the, the amendment to the criminal code, Bill C-218, um, is of vital importance that we get this right. But I think this has been an issue, uh, and we came really close in 2014, 2015, in, in single sport betting becoming legal uh, at that point. I think it died in the Senate just before the election in 2015. But I can remember sitting um, at the offices in the CCS uh, in 2014, I believe, maybe 2013, um, when we were outlining kind of what we were doing in this space and some of the issues that, that we were facing. We had a meeting in Ottawa that involved probably about 50 people. And it was the RCMP, some, some other law enforcement agencies, uh, the government of Canada. Um, we had Canadian, uh, the Canadian Gaming Association there along with our governing bodies to talk about this issue. Uh, as we headed into the 2015 World Cup. Um, and, and it was, I think, an eye-opener for everyone at that point. Uh, so it's no surprise that that people feel to some degree ill-equipped or, or, or unprepared for, for what's coming. Um, we have, as I said before, been, been at this for quite a while. Um, FIFA have a very robust system of, of not just reporting, but educating all of its members, all 211 member associations have uh, integrity, officers, integrity officers. I am one from, from Canada um, and we meet monthly. We have, we have a separate section within FIFA's website that deals specifically with integrity. Um, we all have access to it. We share information regularly. Uh, and it's something that, that is constantly um, in front of us. It just within the last sort of two months, uh, I've had three cases across my desk, uh, none of which involved match manipulation, but two of which were, were messages that I received from Sport Radar, who, who do our betting analysis, who do our gaming analysis for us, who had highlighted some irregular betting patterns um, in and around some of our competitions, which we then investigated and found that that they were sort of unexplained that the matches um, weren't fixed. And we've received a couple of uh, whistleblower um, reports sent to FIFA. FIFA then communicate that back to us and we investigate those at the same time, again, through, through, our, through our, our partners at Sport Radar. So it's something that's, that's vitally important to us, but I would argue that it's vitally important to the sport community. Um, so again, I, I applaud the work uh, and I think this is a very vital first step in getting the policy right, getting the regulatory piece in place so that we're all protecting um, the integrity of Dutch sport with the competitions that we all run domestically and internationally, to be fair. Thanks very much, Earl. Um, uh, thanks for sharing your perspective and the, the work of FIFA, um, yeah, who have done a, a great amount of work in this space. And um, for those who are on the call who have questions or are looking for assistance, I'm, I'm sure Earl would be happy to help you um, more directly too, if you feel free to reach out to him. Um, it's unfortunate Dan couldn't join us, but what I'll just say in, in his place is, uh, well, really to just thank him for his contributions to the working group. Um, he was a, an active member um, and it was good to hear from his sport and kind of the challenges that he saw um, and the benefits that this template policy would provide uh, for squash. So um, we'll move along, uh, having heard from Earl, um, to introduce to you the policy that was developed um, by the working group. Um, and as mentioned, it was really, the goal was to prepare sport organizations to deal with this issue in a proactive way, um, in a comprehensive way, uh, so that it could include in all, in one policy document, um, all of the uh, efforts to combat match manipulation. We wanted to be consistent with the IOC's code. 
um, and which is also consistent with most international federations codes so as far as how you define what's allowed and what's not allowed, reporting requirements, investigations, those things. The goal with the template policy was to make sure it was aligned with those things. Um, as Lizanne mentioned, uh, the COC is encouraging sports to adopt the policy or some variation of the policy. And I just, I added the last bullet as a, a, because we've noticed that some sport organizations and there could be opportunities for many um, to have a, commercial partnerships with betting operators uh, or regulators. And I think this policy um, works really well to mitigate the risk of match manipulation and goes hand in hand if, if as a sport organization, you are looking to go down that route. So those are some of the goals in developing the policy. And if we move along to the next slide, I'm going to invite David Leck, who's, who, as I mentioned, is general counsel for the CCS. And he really uh, was the author of the policy, uh, getting feedback from the working group on various iterations of it, but really put it together. Um, and I wanted to call on him to provide a high level overview of the policy. Go ahead, David. Jeremy, welcome everybody. The first thing I wanted to comment on is that I learned when we sat with the working group to try to put this policy together that one size fits all wouldn't work. It simply was going to be impossible to come up with a template policy, even at a high level, that would work without adjustments be, being needed on a sport by sport basis. So this is a template. I'm confident that it provides a useful tool for many different sports, big and small, to be compliant with certainly the demands of the IOC because this is the base that we use to start drafting this code. But most importantly, we left areas open and I'll go through them where these rules, this template has to be fine tuned to match the needs of every sport. So there are things that we have been able to use consistently and there are other things that have to be adjusted and tweaked and built to make it work on a sport by sport basis. And that really brings me to the first point is that this policy has to be a policy of each unique sport organization. It's unlike the Canadian anti-doping program where CCES essentially administers the program on behalf of the sport community. What we created was a, a, a match manipulation policy template for your sport and it has to be managed and run through your sport. So the key parts of the policy, I won't go into them in great detail, but obviously we set out the, the issue of jurisdiction. Essentially, who does the policy apply to and how will you acquire jurisdiction over those people? So this is an area you'll see in, in 2.2, it's, it's highlighted. Each sport has different rules in terms of how they acquire jurisdiction. Some of it's through membership, some of it's through contract, et cetera. So the issue of jurisdiction is absolutely critical and that will have to be fine tuned on a sport by sport basis. The second big heading, it's consistent. These are the actual offenses, the corruption offenses. So this is the prohibited conduct that the match manipulation policy is trying to, is to, trying to tackle. Um, betting is in there, but it's important that this is more than an anti-gambling policy. Betting is only part of the focus of trying to control the manipulation of sporting outcomes. So it's a very wide swath of conduct that is caught here. We were advised, Earl gave us great feedback from FIFA's experience that the corruption offenses need to be drafted quite expansively to make sure you catch the mischief that we're trying to address. So it talks about betting on your own sport, in your own competitions, bribery, um, sharing inside information, failing to cooperate, and even there's deemed offenses where if you've attempted to do any of these um, misconduct, that's enough to put you offside in, in the policy. So I'm going to not go further than simply say it's broadly drafted, and we think that it, A, matches the IOC sense of what corruption offenses are and are wide enough to capture most of the misconduct that we expect to see. The third thing are the reporting obligations. The critical issue is how does a sport organization learn about match manipulation? Inevitably, it's insiders. Inevitably, they are told about information dealing with one of the corruption offenses. And so there's an obligation 
on the people that are subject to this policy to report suspected match manipulation. There's clearly powers to investigate because once that information is brought forward, the sport organization needs to be able to take action, to look into it, to investigate it, to try to see if there is uh, a factual background to proceed to a hearing. This is the second area where we found it impossible to make a common approach. Each sport organization, because it will have to be an internal hearing, it'll have to be an independent internal hearing process in each of your sports, that will have to be added in here. We simply couldn't design a one size fits all hearing process for each sport that might, that might adopt that. Obviously at the end of a hearing, either the corruption offense will be made out or not. If it is made out, huge issue is what will the sanction be? And, and the working group struggled, I would say mightily with this to try to come up with the fairest sanction regime. And in the end, I believe it's correct, and I think there was general acceptance that the sanctions aren't set. There's not ranges like an anti-doping, it's very broad. And at least for now, this will give the hearing panels a great deal of discretion to come up with the appropriate sanction. So in terms of fines, it's up to $100,000 and the return of winnings from the inappropriate conduct. In terms of ineligibility, it's wide open. It's from a warning to life ineligibility. Very, very broad. Every time we came to we tried to come up with more nuanced ranges for different conduct, we ran into roadblocks about uh, this not being fair in any given situation. So quite frankly, for now, we're leaving it quite open-ended. The, the, the hearing panel within each sport who will hear these matters will come up with their own decision about what the sanction ranges should be. And of course, there's the power to appeal those decisions to the SDRCC. So there will be appeal mechanisms to hear, um, to hear uh, appeals from first instance decisions. And lastly, there was a great deal of discussion around when this policy would be effective we decided that it was hugely problematic to make it retrospective so that this policy will only speak to conduct from the, the effective date moving forward, but that sport organizations had to act within a period of two years after learning of the misconduct to bring the matter forward to a hearing. So we are not going to be dealing with this policy in, in historic cases. It will be from the effective date forward, but sports can't sit on it for years and years and years. There's a two year period before it has to come to a hearing or nothing more can be done about those allegations. So that gives you a sense of what we try to do. I'm comfortable that it's workable and, and certainly all of the team at CCS is very, very happy to work with you to make this work in your sport because I wanna finish with that. This is a framework but it has to be made operational inside your sport. And we're happy to help you do that. There will be a different policy for every single sport with these common features that I've highlighted. So those are really the, the, the points that I wanna make. Uh, and, I'm, and at any time, I'm happy to uh, address specific questions about that. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks very much, David. It was really helpful um, overview of, uh, of the policy that was created. And, and um, as I mentioned, the, the, at the outset of the working group, um, when we started to discuss this issue, um, a question was raised about whether a sport, sport organizations currently have rules, currently have rules in place to be able to address this issue, and very few did. Um, so the, the goal of this template policy is to provide your organization with a comprehensive way to deal with this issue so you can feel confident that you've mitigated the risk as effectively as you can against match manipulation. Um, so that was the fourth area of today's webinar was to uh, inform you of the developments of the working group around that policy. Uh, we'll move on to the fifth area, the final area, which is just a, an offer of assistance, both from the CCS and from the COC. Uh, David mentioned um, that we would be more than pleased to help your sport understand the template policy. 
um, and help your sport think about how it would go about implementing it. So if that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out. And we're more than happy to have a conversation with you and, and help you work towards using that policy within your sport. We've developed some resources. The first was an infographic, which you saw earlier on in this webinar. If you would like to use it, feel free to um, let us know and we can provide it to you. Lizanne mentioned the IOC has a number of resources. Uh, they're really, really good resources. Um, and the link is there. Uh, plus I think she'll send it around to you as well. And um, uh, FIFA also has some great resources um, that I'm sure uh, Earl could share and your international federation um, may as well. So I would encourage you to reach out to them if you don't already know what they're doing in this space. Um, what we're looking to develop in the coming months to help you further would be an online education course, an e-learning course that would explain to athletes and support personnel and, and other participants what this issue is, how it's dealt with. And if you go down the route of using the template policy, we've built the education course to be able to inform people about the rules that are set out in that policy. So it would go hand in hand. It doesn't have to be used in conjunction with the policy, but it, it works well um, if you choose to use it that way. So I wanted to, to let you know that. Um, and we'll also be working on a reporting tool um, that if you have interest in using, you could use. And it's essentially, it's the report doping platform that we have that we could also use for issues related to match manipulation. David mentioned the importance of reporting, uh, that it's an obligation to report um, so that if you are approached by someone to do something, you have a safe way to do so through an anonymous type of reporting uh, tool, which we'll be developing. So I wanted to highlight those things uh, as well as part of the fifth area of our webinar today. So what's upcoming? Um, we intend to hold another webinar, the CCS and the COC, uh, but this one would be more specific to single event sports betting, um, how your organization might be able to leverage that opportunity, understanding um, the value of your data, the relationships that you might have in this space, possible revenue generation. This is not an area of CCS expertise at all, um, but we appreciate that it is um, part of the discussion around uh, gambling and betting on sport. And between the CCS and the COC, we wanted to organize a session that could introduce you to some of those things and provide some experts to be able to speak to them. So that will happen uh, in April post the Olympics and the Paralympics. I mentioned the learning module that's being created. Our goal is to have that done by April. And then really from now and throughout um, 2022, we're here to help as is the COC. So if you're interested in the template policy, do not hesitate to reach out and we'd be more than pleased to assist you. So those were the main things we wanted to cover as part of this webinar. We wanted to bring you up to speed on the developments that have been occurring in Canada around both the policy and the legal initiatives. We wanted to remind you of the issue uh, that we're dealing with. We wanted to inform you of the IOC and the code that's being developed on the international front and how it might impact your sport. We wanted to share with you the template policy and the resources that have been developed um, and then lastly, we wanted to leave you with an offer of assistance from both the CCS and the COC as you think about how you want to move forward in trying to address this issue. That's what we wanted to cover in the webinar, and, and we wanted to leave some time for a Q&A session. So I think we have that time. Lizanne, I don't know if there's been anything added into the chat box. No, there haven't. A few people have written just to ask for the slides and the material, so I dropped in the, both the slides are in there, but then there's also a slew of links that I dropped in and all of our emails. So if anything comes up afterwards, please be sure to reach out. We are here to help. Okay. And maybe we'll just pause for a second and see if anyone has a question. It's always awkward in these virtual types of settings to be able to, to raise it, but happy to address it if anyone wants to unmute themselves and, and ask any question. Um, there's a number of us here who'd be happy to try and, and help. Yeah, I see Brian has raised his hand. So yeah, Brian, go ahead, please. Oh, thanks. Um, and thank you for doing this. This is very informative. Appreciate it. Um, I can't help but notice in the, uh, in the description of this 
uh, template policy. A lot of common elements with most sport organizations' current code of conduct policies. Um, has anybody thought about merging the two to create you know, one comprehensive policy rather than two separate ones? Uh, thanks for your question, Brian. I may ask David if um, if that if thought had been given to that in the development of the policy. Um, Brian, thank you. Yes, and I think the biggest issue, you could put in the prohibited conduct in a code of conduct policy, but the big issue was the, the, the whole notion of um, concrete reporting. That seemed to be absolutely critical in match manipulation to address match manipulation. And the feedback we got is that that's not precisely how most sports want to manage their code of conduct arrangements. So is it possible? Yes. Uh, it would, I think it, it would be a bit like the tail wagging the dog. I think this would be more onerous um, just because of the nature of what would be required to fight match manipulation, but it would be possible uh, to put in other kinds of, of misconduct, code of conduct issues. We felt it was easier to call a spade a spade and say, look, it's the same hearing process, but this has a unique set of demands and a unique set of needs to tackle this problem, which is probably quite different from a more run of the mill code of conduct situation. So the short answer is it's possible. We felt it was more appropriate to have a standalone policy, which will be easier to educate on. Great, thank you for that answer. That's uh, quite informative as well. Um, my second question, and it might be too early to, to be able to provide an answer to this, but um, we all know that the independent safe sport mechanism is under development and soon be operational. Uh, do you see any role for them in this whole area or is that again, totally separate? Well, may, let me jump in and Jeremy may want to, right now I think it's separate because this template was absolutely designed on a sport by sport basis. We may evolve this initiative into a pan Canadian method of approaching match manipulation. And if that was the case, then there may be more overlap with a pan-Canadian solution, like we have for anti-doping, like is being built for safe sport. I think the fair answer is we're not there yet. We're still at early days, basically educating the Canadian sport community that this is an issue. It's a real issue. And at least we want basic tools to allow each sport to respond. So what you're positing is maybe where we're gonna get to in five or 10 years, but we're simply not there right now, Brian. Jeremy, anything to add to that? No, I, th I think that's a good um, response. I just maybe see if there's any other thoughts from anyone on the call about Brian's question and if they see things any differently. No, doesn't seem seem like it. Thanks, David. Um, look, any other questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself and and go ahead and ask your question or offer any comments. Okay, hearing none at this point in time. Thank you, Brian, for your question. Um, we'll move on to conclude our webinar uh, for today. And as I say, I wanna, th I wanna thank the COC um, for joining us with this webinar. I'd like to thank David for his participation. Earl, uh, as always, thank you for your um, expertise and offering it to the group. Uh, I hope Dan is okay and uh, we'll hear from him soon and I'm sure he'll be able to share his insight uh, at a later date with all of us. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, maybe just before we conclude, I'll turn it over to you, Lizanne, in the event that you'd like to offer any concluding remarks. No, I think that's great from our perspective. And just, again, we will be sharing the, both the recording and the resources mentioned uh, following this on both the NSO Sharing Center and on the CCS website. So we'll be sure to circulate that to your organizations. So thanks so much for being here. Great, thanks Lizanne. Thanks everyone. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day.